All right, good. Okay, so last time, and again, you know, stop me as we go along, you guys have questions or concerns. Let me share my screen too. Yeah, so, you know, if you guys have any questions, I mean, I know this is unfamiliar to, to many of you, so, you know, please just, you know, uh, feel free to speak up. You know, this is designed to be, be helpful. So, um, all right, so last time what we had done is we were basically kind of working our way through the different parts of the system that, that I provide. So we looked at the, um, the front end component that's actually drawing stuff on the screen. So we looked at the, the and that's in our um, example Gatsby product, so that project. So that's this little, well, I guess it's getting longer now, but a lot of it is comments. Um, this little component that's actually responsible for um, doing a couple of things. First of all, you know, rendering the UI. Um, this is something that you know React components are expected to do. Have a render function that's supposed to return uh, content. We're going to see a little bit of a different take on that in a minute. But this is a presentational component. So what's coming out of my render method um, is actual HTML. And so this component is responsible for, um, in this case, doing two things. One is uh, showing a list of the messages that have been sent in this room so far. Um, and the second is rendering a text field that allows somebody to, to send a new message. Um, so now let's look at, uh, so today I want to at least sort of try to get through the, the other two big parts of this, right? So now I'm going into the client directory in the, in the project and we're going to look at um, the actual context provider. Okay, so the, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying, trying to sort of explain the rationale behind some of this. So, um, in, in, in a React, uh, a React, a, a fully React page, you actually don't have to use React to, to render an entire page. You can have, uh, you can attach React to individual parts of an existing website, and it'll just work fine. Um, however, any React component or an entire React page, you can think of the structure as a lot like HTML, um, in the sense that you have components that wrap other components. Um, and things like this. The, um, and so, you know, in our, you know, we look at our front end component here, this is, some of this is HTML, but then some of this, this is actually another React component that I'm rendering here. This is part of the Material UI React library. So if we think about what's gonna happen, there's code for this text field component that's in the Material UI library that's going to get called and it's gonna, its render method is going to be called and it's going to be passed these props and it may maintain its own state and stuff like that. Um, so React components can render HTML, they can also render other React components. Now there's this question of how does state, uh, certain pieces of state or certain types of information move around in, in a system like this, right? Um, and so, you know, we can you know, there, there's one model, right, which you're seeing here, which is we pass stuff around in props. Um, and this is something that you can do. This is one way of providing state to a component, right, which is that you provide the state via the prop. Now, this works fine for certain types of information, but there's other pieces of information that we might um, need to maintain sort of globally. So imagine I have some, some piece of global state. For our chat component, that could be, for example, the rooms that this particular window is subscribed to. Um, that might be information about the state of the connection to the backend server. So this is global state. And it's actually not used by most of the page. So, right, you know, when we're done integrating this into the entire CS125 website, there will be bits and pieces of the site that are going to, you know, uh, implement a, a, a chat component. But then there's all sorts of other bits and pieces of the site that have nothing to do with this and don't care one way or another that, that it exists. Um, and that's actually, again, one of the nice features about React is it allows you to focus on just a small part of the page, which particularly when you're building interactive components can quickly get pretty complicated, but I don't have to worry about the rest of the site. So if we look at our little demo site, for example, like these are all components that, that, that we wrote, for example. So this login button is something that I designed. And I've totally forgotten how it works, except for the fact that it does. Um, and you know, same thing with the, you know, the the light dark thing, right? I mean, we've we've spent some time and energy on this, and now I don't have to think about it. It's just on there on the page. So 
the so this is so again this is idea of sort of global state in React, right? You think of your page as an actual application. How do I store state high up in my application that multiple parts of the page might be? So there's there's one set of tools that was built up around this that's known as Redux that you guys might have heard of. That's um, it's not an official React um, project, but it's very much part of the React ecosystem. There's a lot of people that use it as part of their projects. And it works fine. I've used it in the past for, for, for React-based projects. That's one solution. And the idea with Redux is you maintain a single piece of state that represents the state for the entire um, the entire site. That can be broken down like any other JavaScript object into different parts that are represent different separation of concerns or whatever. Um, and then components can subscribe to updates of that state so that they only see when certain values change. Um, Redux has been around for a while. Um, not too long ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, React decided to release their own approach to this problem. And this is the idea of context, okay? Sorry, let me come back to props. So the other solution for this is to do what's called, you'll hear this term, prop drilling. Um, prop drilling means if I have a component that's way up in the tree and it needs to get information to a component that's like many, many levels below it, I literally had to have to add a prop to every single component on the path between the component that I want to get state from and the, the component that I want to get state to. And that's miserable, right? I mean, the term prop drilling is, is just about as awful as it sounds. So that is not something that, that, that we're interested, that we're going to be interested in doing. That's not a pattern that, that we want to, uh, that, that this could work like, you know, for, you know, small, um, small pieces of, of information that you only need to pass around a couple of levels. But for something like this where, you know, again, I don't even have control over the entire path between the top level component that's going to do some of the library type work for us and the chat box. I don't even know where this chat box might be. It might be anywhere on the page. Right? So this is really not, um, not a model that we're, we're, we're going to be able to, to, to follow. Okay, can someone say something in the chat just so I know it's working? Anybody? Hello. Okay, sweet. Um, yeah, you're good. Okay, I hate, I fucking hate Zoom. Okay. Why? Do you want us to be more like reactive as you? No, 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 it's fine. This? I just, I, I, I get, I, I get this stupid Zoom like window in the corner and then I can't get rid of it. I know there's a way to just move it to another page, but I have to like, hold on a sec. Uh, why can't? It's something that people use so much. Zoom is like surprisingly unintuitive to me. Let's see. Hide you video. Also, yeah, you can hide the thumbnail video as well. Yeah, okay. I just, I just managed to do that. That's, that's, okay, great. Um, all right. So, so anyway, so, so we want a way to share information between um, essentially this context provider component we're going to look at in a minute and then a component that's anywhere on the page. And so before we get to the context of the right, I just want to show you quickly where that linkage happens. And it's right here, right? So right at the top of my presentational component, I call this function called use shitter. And we're going to see where we define that function. The convention for context providing functions in functional React components is they start with the word use. This exposes two pieces of state to my presentational component. One is this connected Boolean that indicates whether or not I have a connection to the backend server. That's uh, highlighted right now because I'm not using it anywhere. And the second is a, actually a function that's called join. And that's what gets called um, when the component actually starts up. So you'll see there's a call here to join in this use effect call, which I can, I can talk about in a minute. Uh, use effect is a hook that's run after the component is rendered. So use effect is a good place to do things like set up subscriptions. Uh, is that, to, yeah, is that like is that like component did mount in a uh, class based component? Yes. Yeah. It's similar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, except it also allows you to pr provide dependencies. So oh, essentially, okay. you can think of it this way: this the the callback in here, this code will run. The first time the component is mounted after it renders for the first time, and then any time any of these dependencies change. 
Mm, now, okay. a couple of these dependencies are a little bit silly, like join is not going to change and set messages is not going to change. But I have a, a linting option set up that kind of forces us to put those in there. Uh, otherwise, um, the React hooks ES lint um, thing will get annoyed. However, the room might change, right? So remember we talked before that a component's props can change. So it might be that I'm rendering this component in a way so that the room is modified, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I have like one chat component on the page and I set it up, I control it from above so that the room can change over time. Well, it makes sense now that when the room changes, I need to call join again so that I join the correct room, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, th this is all code we're gonna have to fix. Like this is stuff, this is just sort of placeholders. And there, you guys might think that there's other information that, that the parent, that this context provider needs to show. But again, we'll get there. This isn't necessarily gonna make a lot of sense right away. Um, okay, so now let's let's go up and we'll look at the actual, uh, the sort of the, 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 the client wrapper. So again, this is another, this is just another React component. Um, but what you'll notice here, down here, when we look at the render method, which is right here, actually, this is another functional component. So you're looking at the render method, it's this whole thing. But what am I returning from this render method? I don't see any HTML in this component anywhere. And we're gonna try to make sure that our library does not have any HTML in it. Um, we might do things like use browser APIs or whatever, but we're not gonna actually render any HTML. What this component does, you'll see that it takes two props right now. One prop is the server to connect to, this is the string. Um, the second prop is a React node. So basically this says, I can wrap myself around another React node. And that's all it does. So it sets up some information. Uh, we'll talk about what this, is, what, what this is doing either. It establishes a connection to the back end. This component's gonna need to maintain some state internally. Um, and then what it does is it uses this context provider that's part of, of the React library to pass as a piece of chitter context this value. Okay, so we're passing down three pieces of information right now. This is this Boolean. Uh, we're also passing down the list of rooms that we're subscribed to. Um, and then this join method. So we're, we're kind of working backwards, but you can hopefully see the let me see if I can get this to open, open side by side. Yeah, there we go. You can see sort of the, the connection here, right? So this call is pulling information that was passed on this object. I'm actually not using all of it right now. I'm not using the room uh, array, and I don't actually know what we're gonna need to put in here. This is something that we'll have to do in a bit. The, the actual function that's, that's used, all it's doing is calling use context with different context, but this is sort of a pattern in React, right? You just provide this little wrapper function that follows that naming convention and passes this piece of, piece of information down. So, okay, is so use, sorry, yeah, is, use, is use context that's predefined in like React, right? Yeah, this is coming out of the React library. Yeah. This okay. Is, we're, we're and when you call use context, like whatever it, components are wrapped in this context provider have access to like all the values from that provider, right? Exactly, right? So, this, this, it, you know, going back to our, our discussion a minute ago, this is essentially a way for you to pass state within a React application, but without having to do prop drilling. So sure. any component that subscribes to this context can retrieve this information. It doesn't matter where it is in the component tree as long as I've, it's inside this context provider. So what's the, what's the benefit there versus Redux, where you have this like sort of you know, similar pattern of like subscribing to a, a global state? So it's, it's a great question. I mean, you can, a lot of people use Redux and it's certainly something that's out there that, um, you know. Yeah, I, I, I just was, I wasn't sure if this was like opinionated versus uh, as a, um, like a design pattern or something. So, so I, so one of the things I've never been able to figure out, so I've, I've used Redux. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have always been concerned about with Redux is, is composability. Um, so to me, it's always seemed like, and maybe I just haven't seen the right pattern for doing this. Redux is great if you're building like a single page application and you don't expect to share a lot of that state between other applications. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, and this is just how I've seen it used, 
when you start building Redux, you kind of, Redux wants you to put everything in one place, right? Redux wants you to be like, there is a single store for my application. That store has all of the state for the entire application. Right. Okay. The problem becomes, what if I want to reuse a particular component in a couple of places on different sites? Right. Okay. Yeah. So now it's like, I've just never seen a good way of doing this, right? Where it's like now on each site, I have to kind of fit it into my existing store somehow or something. I've just, yeah, this, this, this has been my concern with, with, with Redux. Mm -hmm. With React Context, well, A, I also don't like re all of Redux's stupid functional programming bullshit. It's just like, it's a little too, it's a little too opinionated for, for my case. Yeah. Okay. Uh, about reduce. I mean, I've also, I've, I've, I've written a lot of Redux stuff and the amount of boilerplate required is pretty staggering. Um, to the point where there are actually like libraries that help you write Redux with less boilerplate, at which point, you know, you have a problem, right? Like if someone is building a library to allow someone to use your library with less boilerplate, then maybe you should have built that library. Um, sure. So yeah, it, 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 it again, like, um, the, the sort of ill-fated CS125 app that we worked on for, for a while, we used Redux there and I, I came away sort of not super thrilled with, with it. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing, people use it, you know, I mean, people have success with it. I, so far, I've actually been pretty happy with this model of building small component, like trying to build simple systems that involve like a single context provider and some, and then some presentation components. And I've had good luck composing those across multiple sites. Um, gotcha. So, so that's, so for example, let me go just, just so you kind of see where, where we're going with this. So this is my little, um, this is my little testing project for the, some of the components we're going to use on the new uh, CS125 website. And I'll show you, um, and I'm going to show you this in a minute. So, for example, this is this is code that wraps the entire site, um, and you can see this is one context provider that that we created. This is another one. This is another mm -hmm. one. Each one of these is providing a different piece of state to a different subset of components below it. Um, and so, the cool thing is, when we're done with our with our chitter component, I'll just add it here. And then we'll be able to use that front end component anywhere we want. Cool. Okay. The other thing that that React fixed that sorry that that was a problem uh, that's actually one of the reasons why we're using functional components is that so, so let me finish talking about uh, my context. So I said yeah, before that there were two reasons that a component would be rendered. One is the state changes. The other is the props change. Well, it's actually a third one, which is that the context Changes to context will also trigger a re-render, but only for the components that subscribe to that context. So for example, if we did something with the, and, and we can do this in a minute if we want, you can kind of see it in action. If we were using this connected um, flag to do something, like maybe we gray out the UI while the, while the, until the chat server reconnects or something like that, right? If we were doing something with it and it was being modified by the context provider, those modifications happen immediately, right? Um, so that's pretty nice. The other thing, going back to one of the nice things about context with, with um, sort of functional React components is that you can subscribe to multiple pieces of context. Um, so if you have a component that needs several pieces of information, right? Like maybe it needs some login information that also needs whatever, you can actually subscribe to two context providers and get updates from both. Um, so that's, so to me, it, it feels like React Context has essentially is, at this point is, particularly if you're using functional components, at this point, it's basically feature equivalent with Redux. Um, but I have found that the, com the composability patterns for, uh, for Context are better, in my opinion. And the actual like call to um, use Chitter is yep. like the process of that component subscribing to the, the um, context provider, right? Exactly. Like that's yeah. the place that happens. Okay. Right. Exactly. So, 
so when I, so, so there's, you know, there's three things that will cross my component to render. One is props. This is passed to the component from above. Yep. The other is state, which in my functional components, I'm setting up piece by piece using these use state calls, right? So this component has two pieces of state, it has the message list, and it has the input. Right. And then any con any calls to a context provider, right? Gotcha. This this is just this little convenience. I could just call use context and pass the co type of context I want to subscribe to, right? That would also work. But again, oh, okay. I, yeah. Pat, I'm I'm just exposing this as a convenience, right? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so these are, these are great, great question. So, okay, so now let's look at our context provider component. This is just another piece of React code. It's another React component. The, the difference here is that this one, the context provider, you typically want to put very, very high up in the tree. So you want the context provider to wrap the entire page. Um, so you saw a minute ago when I, I'll show you this again, when we looked here, um, Gatsby provides this function called wrap root element that allows you to uh, add components that wrap the entire page. And this is where we put all of our context providers. Um, so this is our login provider. This is a provider that tracks page activity. This is a provider that saves editor content. Um, all of those providers are, are mounted very, very high up in the tree. And then all of the rest of the page, including everything that the user sees, goes inside here. For our demo, um, I've done something similar. So the, the Chitter demo and example is building on top of our CS125 Gatsby theme. So it already has all those components mounted. That's why the login box works, right? So this login box is dependent on that login component. And the reason it works is because the login, the, there's not only this, this uh, presentational component, but there's also a login provider that's sitting high up on the tree that is communicating. Um, this is the same thing with the, uh, the theme switcher. It works exactly the same way. Um, the, for, our, for our demo, what I've done is I've, put, I've added another wrap root element and I've added our chitter provider. Again, so, so, so this, is, this is like wrapping the entire page. So all of the other page elements are going to be inside this context provider. There'll be a couple that will be above it, but there'll be like other context providers that I'm not expecting to use information from this one. Now, if you do need to pass information between these, then you do need to make sure that you compose them properly. So for example, again, going back and looking at this example, I've got three context providers here, but this login provider is actually really important because it provides identity information to a bunch of other context providers. We're gonna use, we're gonna use this information as well in our own chat server eventually. So you'll see this is essentially the one for our 125 pages that's at the very top of the tree. Um, and then you'll see that the token that it's providing when you log in is passed to our page tracker because it uses it to identify you in our database and also to the, uh, the editor saver thingy because uh, again, it, it does the same thing. Okay, all right, cool. So, so, so that's where this component is. So now let's look at what it's actually, oh, did I open the wrong one? No, I did, I opened the right one, okay. So let's look at what it's actually, what it's actually doing, all right? So again, this is another React component. We can read it from top to bottom. Um, all of this will get executed every time the component renders, but there are some important exceptions to that. So calls to use state only get, essentially only get run once. Uh, or the state only gets initialized one. Um, this is, so use ref is a little strange. Um, use ref is essentially a way to set up a, um, you can think of it as setting up a persistent variable that does not change across calls to render, but it's private. Anything you set up with use ref does not trigger a render if it changes, but it also doesn't, um, so, so for example, if I do something like this, I say const um, whatever is equal to five, every single time the component renders, whatever will be reassigned the value five. If I use use ref, this will only happen the first time the component uh, runs. Um, I don't, I, I don't wanna go too much into details here, but essentially what we're doing here is we are pulling a, we're using this to store a unique 
identifier that identifies the um, browser path, okay? So browsers provide two types of storage where you can basically, you can treat it like a key value store or a map. Uh, one is called local storage. Local storage is shared across the entire browser instance, so all tabs have access to the same local storage information. Session storage, on the other hand, is uh, done on a per tab basis. So the reason we're doing this, we'll talk about this a little bit later, is we want to be able to handle refreshes. So despite the fact that the way that the web works is dramatically different today, users continue to do these stupid things like refresh the page, okay? Um, when they do that, we don't want the we don't want everything to fall over, right? We want the backend server to remember what rooms this tab was a part of and things like that, right? So this is what we're doing to make sure that that happens. The idea here is that if we have an, so we're using uh, unique IDs, something called UUID v4, this creates like a long string with a certain structure that is, you can assume to be unique across any number of calls to this function. What we do here is we store this, um, actually, I don't think, <laughs> I think I'm forgetting, I think I'm actually forgotten to store it, so we, we, we should store it somewhere. Uh, we're supposed, the idea is that we want to store it in uh, session storage so that it doesn't change. If we don't find it in session storage, we just recreate a new one. But again, I, I think I've messed up and we need to add some, some code to actually save it so we can do that stuff. Okay, so, so far, so, so now again, now the thing we want to start thinking about is like, what does, so, you know, imagine I have a couple different chat rooms on my page. What sort of information do they need to maintain? And also, how should that state be divided? So, we actually have three places in our application where we can store state. We can store state on the server. We can store state here. Now, this is going to be state that's going to be per path. Um, and then we can also store per component state or per chat room state. Um, and so as we start to think about, you know, where different parts of, uh, where different information should live, that's one way, uh, one thing to keep in mind, right? We've got the server. The server is, um, is very persistent, right? We can, you know, if we write our code carefully, we can assume the server uh, is up for long periods of time. It can also save things in databases and stuff like that. Um, this component is on a per tab basis, um, but it can store things like a connection that we don't want the actual individual chat components to store. But then the chat components also have their own information that they know, right? They know like the room that they're assigned to and stuff like that. So one other thing I want to point out as we as we talk about this. So so you know, some people might wonder, like, why why not just why can't I write just one component, right? So you could, you could actually write one single chat component that essentially did all of the work that we're doing in the context provider, and then also did all the presentational work, right? So it would, when it was created, it would connect to the server, it would handle the connection, it would uh, draw the screen, it would do everything, right? Um, and and there's, there's two reasons that we don't want to do things that way. Um, one, one the, the, the less important one is that that would, that would mix up the presentation logic with our uh, this, the interactions with the server and, and the, sort of the interesting things, right? The client server protocol and stuff like that. That's less, that's a little bit less of a, of a great rationale because there are ways to compose React components that would allow us to avoid that. So if we wanted to, we could build a, um, like a chitter connection component that would handle all of the non-presentational bits right, setting up the WebSocket connection, handling the communication with the server, stuff like that, but still, and still defer all of the presentational logic to a presentational component. We could do it that way. Um, the, the, the reason we're not, um, I mean, one of the reasons we're not, is if you think about it, at that point, every single chat room component is independent from all the others, despite the fact that they actually have a lot of stuff that they should be able to share. Right. One thing, for example, they should be able to share is they should be able to share a connection to the server. Um, now, in cases where you're not expecting to have more than one of these on a page, you might be able to get away with that. It might be totally okay. Right. Um, but in cases where you are expecting to have more than one on a page, my preference is usually to, to do it this way, where you build a context provider where you just kind of a library function. And then 
Do you allow the presentation components to subscribe to context? And you try to do most of the work up here. So now what this will mean, so for example, like our, our little playground component that we use on, on the Kotlin website, we'll be using on the 125 website, that's a similar idea. That component could make its own web, you know, web API request to our little Java playground backend, but it doesn't. Instead, we have a context provider, and then the component is pretty simple. All it does when it wants to run code or do something is it sends the code to the context provider. The context provider does what needs to be done, communicates with the server, and then tells it, here's the output. Okay, so now we're looking, so uh, we're looking at some state here next that is state that the context provider will need to maintain. Right. And again, this is stuff that we're going to have, you guys are going to have to add stuff to as we go. Right. Not like none of this is done. It's nowhere remotely close to being done. The presentational component is probably not too far off, but we'll need to do some work there too. But this and the server are very much just a skeleton. So don't, you know, when you guys go forward and I start asking you to do stuff, don't feel like this has to exist. Some of the stuff doesn't need to be here. Maybe some of it can be modified. There's probably some more elegant ways to organize some of this information. It's, it's totally cool. Um, right now, I'm storing two pieces of state. One is, am I connected to the, to the backend server or not? And the second is the list of rooms that this client, this tab, is subscribed to. Now, again, that might be more than one if I've got two different chat components on the same page uh, that are joined in different rooms. Um, but it might only be. All right. So, when this component first runs, so I'm using a use effect call here. Um, I'm using a private variable created uh, by use ref to store this connection information. And then the first time the component uh, is rendered, after that render completes, this is where we set up the connection to our, to our backend server. And you'll notice this is a long, it's a long method. You'll notice that the dependency array for this also includes the source. So again, you know, I'm talking about this as if I'm familiar with it because I am. Those of you that are new, use effect. The code inside this will run once after the component renders, and then any time the server variable changes. Okay. So why do I have to rerun if the server variable changes? Well, you'll see in here I'm using the server inside this method because that's the target of my connection. The server variable, the server prop for this component, which you can see up here, is expected to uh, indicate the server uh, URL that I'm going to connect to. Now, in practice, we don't expect this to change. We expect when you, we create one of these components, it's going to connect to the same server every time. Um, but you know, React is, is good about warning us here, basically saying, hey, if this server variable changes, there is code inside here that depends on it. So, if somebody changes the server prop for your component, uh, you do need to reestablish a connection. Okay, so what we're going to do here, so one of the things about use ref is use ref gives you back um, this object that has a current property. The current property might be undefined um, if it hasn't been set before. This syntax is kind of, uh, for those of you that know some Kotlin, this is sort of kotlin -esque. This is optional property syntax for in JavaScript. Um, I actually find myself, when I'm writing TypeScript now, wanting a lot of different syntax from Kotlin, which has some pretty nice features. But anyway, this one does exist. So essentially, this will run close on the WebSocket connection if connection.current is not undefined. So, you know, the, the first time this runs, connection.current will be undefined, close won't be called. But this is cleanup from the previous time. We want to close any existing connections before we create a new one. All right. This next, uh, in this next stanza of code, we're doing a couple of things. We're connecting to the, to the back end, um, and then we're also adding some event listeners to this connection that are callbacks that are going to be triggered when certain interesting things happen. Okay, so the first thing we're doing here is, is we're setting up a WebSocket connection. So, so let me just pause and talk a, a, for a little bit about why do, why do this, right? Um, for a chat app, it's sort of obvious, but I've actually found myself using WebSockets a lot for a lot of my projects, and I, I kind of want to offer some degree of rationale for that. So the, the, the first question is, what's a WebSocket? So the original web model, right? I mean, the web was created to, to serve documents. Um, 
it wasn't created as a programming platform. That's just what it, it has evolved into. So the original web model that you know we introduced in 125, and some of you have done some additional work with later on, or in other languages and frameworks, is this idea of the client makes a request to the server, and the server sends back some information. Now there's a whole vocabulary of different types of requests now. So the client can send some data to the server as part of the request. This is a post request, and actually you can put data in other types of HTML requests as well. The server can obviously send data back, right? That data doesn't have to be an HTML document. It can be text, it can be JSON, it can be XML. Like there's all sorts of different ways of, of organizing. But one of the commonalities here is that the, the client that's initiating the, the, the connection, the communication. Um, and this is actually important for a variety of different reasons because in a lot of cases, a server cannot directly contact a client unless there's an existing connection. But if you think about the original document-oriented model of the internet, this made a lot of sense. It was like the server had a document I wanted, and I needed to request it in order to get it. But now we have these new communication patterns that we need to support modern web applications where the server has information that it needs to send to the client. So again, even something as old and as venerable as Gmail has this feature. Like when you have your Gmail tab open, you do not need to refresh it in order to receive a new message. Um, now, there's a number of different ways of, of, of accomplishing this, okay? I don't want you to make you think that this is all being done in a particular way. Um, one obvious way of doing this is to have your JavaScript code on the client periodically contact the server and say, hey, do you have any new messages for me, right? This is sometimes called polling, okay? So, in this case, there's no long-lived co connection that's established. Instead, the client will just periodically, like every 10 seconds or 15 seconds or minute or whatever, it'll just make a web request, like a get request. You can imagine for Gmail, it's like, hey, do I have any new messages? If the server has new mail for me, it puts it into the body and sends it back. If it doesn't, I just get an empty response, right? So that's one way of doing it. Web sockets are, something that was added to the HTML standard to better support this type of server-initiated server communication. So a WebSocket is a, you can think of it as a persistent connection. It's not just a one-time exchange of information. It establishes a connection between the client and server that is persistent. Uh, and once the connection is established, either side can send messages to the app. So the client can send messages to the server, the servers can send messages to the client. Those messages are received immediately, roughly, right? Um, now, like the old web protocol, the client still has to initiate the connection. So that's what we're doing here, right? We're the client, um, and so we need to actually set up the WebSocket connection. Now, WebSocket support is built into all major web browsers at this point natively. Um, we're using a couple of helper libraries. This one um, is one that I found online. This is responsible for helping make sure that the WebSocket connection stays open. So if it notices the connection goes down, it'll try to reconnect. Um, this, this additional wrapper is something that I wrote actually that I use in a couple of projects. And what it does is it helps keep the connection healthy by having both the client and the server periodically send these empty messages to each other, like ping messages. The reason for this is that there's times when the WebSocket connection can go down, but uh, for, for reasons that are interesting, but kind of peripheral to our conversation, one side doesn't realize it. So it's possible that my server has gone down and the client doesn't know that. Uh, it's also possible that the reverse can happen. So by sending these ping messages periodically, we're making sure that I can still contact the server and that it can contact me because what happens is I send a message and I wait for a response. If I don't get a response, I assume the connection has died and I will initiate the process of, of restarting. Okay, so you might think, you know, for a chat application, something like WebSockets makes a lot of sense, right? Um, it turns out, at least in my opinion, that, that WebSockets actually have a lot of advantages for a variety of different types of applications over a traditional uh, HTML communication protocol. One thing about WebSockets that, that we are going to utilize that's 
actually a really nice thing that you get for free is the server knows how many and what clients are connected to it, okay? So a normal web server that doesn't have a, a you know, it's an establishing WebSocket client really has no idea how many people are out there using, right? You can be on a website and browsing around and reading something, whatever, and the server has no idea you're there because you haven't made a request in a few minutes, right? With the WebSocket connection, as soon as you land on the page, I open up this connection, and then when you leave, the connection gets destroyed. And so I naturally have this present uh, feature that just comes along for free with the WebSocket connection, right? Which is kind of nice. Okay, I've, I've rambled on for long enough. Let's, let's look at some more code. So here I'm setting up the WebSocket. Now, when you establish a WebSocket connection, you are allowed to send query parameters. This turns out to be kind of important because unlike typical HTTP connections, you cannot send parameters. Uh, sorry, you cannot send headers with a WebSocket connection. So frequently, and again, some of you guys that might have done some of the old 125 MPs, a very common authentication pattern with HTTP requests is to put fields in what's called the header. The header has like key value pairs that do things like identify what kind of browser you're using and stuff like that. So if you want to authenticate, you can put a value in there, and then the server can grab it and try to figure out how to use it. Um, with the WebSocket connection, I can't send headers, but I can still send a query string, right? And so what we're doing here is we're actually, um, we're sending, along with our request, uh, three pieces of information. And we will add stuff here in the future. Uh, we're sending our client ID, so that's this, um, this unique ID that identifies this tab. And then we're also sending some version information. Now this is just me being a little fussy, but I find it nice to be able to have this, uh, you know, as you're developing, right? So you know kind of like what versions uh, is everybody using and stuff like that. Okay, so here's where I'm actually making the connection. This little bit of JavaScript basically just combines the server URL with the query string parameters into one connection um, once the connection uh, before so I'm, I'm actually passing some additional uh, fields to this reconnecting WebSocket call to tell it to not start the connection right away normally it would um, I set up some event listeners here which we'll talk about in a minute uh, to receive information about open and close events that means the WebSocket uh, it got turned on or the WebSocket got turned off right or disconnected sorry connected disconnected um, and then I have an event listener for messages. And this is where we're going to do most of our work because this is what gets called when messages arrive from the server. All right, down here, this is the call that actually establishes the connection. One last little piece of use effect goodness. So use effect frequently sets up stuff, like it'll set up a connection in this case. Um, you might wonder, how, do you, how does this stuff get cleaned up when the component is unmounted? So unmounting a component basically means it's been removed from the UI, it's no longer needed. Um, use effect can return a function. This is JavaScript, right? Functions can return functions. This function will be called when the component is unmounted. So this is a place that you can do any sort of cleanup that you want. You don't have to return a function from use effect. We saw that on our uh, presentational component, it didn't, uh, but in this case you can. In this case, basically what we do is we just shut down the WebSocket connection on it. I don't think I really need to do this because that, that value is going away anyway. So, um, okay, questions? I've been talking for a while again, so is everybody still with me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, so hopefully you guys are asking questions because this all just makes perfect sense, which I doubt, but okay. So, so let's keep going. So, so far, what our library, uh, what our context provider is doing is setting up the connection to the web server, web, uh, to the server, and that's pretty much it. There's not a lot else that's going on. Um, I, I will point out that it does set up this join function as a callback, which is passed through the context. And so far, all this does is log the room. Now, you know, you might be wondering, uh, can I see that? And the answer is you can, 
you'll see that right here, when I loaded the page, test got logged twice. And that's actually coming, let's see if these line numbers are right. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that's actually coming from the, um, this piece of code, right? Um, that's all that happens right now when I call join. Obviously, other things need to happen when I call join to the store. So let's look at our server. Um, okay, so now the, you know, on a high level, this is all just TypeScript, but there is an important difference between the stuff we've looked at and the stuff we're looking at now, which is that this is just vanilla TypeScript. It's not React TypeScript. There are no React components here. There's no front end. This is just a piece of server-side code, right? It's in TypeScript, like everything else, um, but it is, you know, there, there's no, there's no presentational stuff. It's just a, it's just a program, right? Don't wrong. Okay. Server-side code is using a very lightweight uh, web framework called Koa. Uh, if you're familiar with Express, Koa is pretty similar. Uh, to be honest, we're probably not going to do much with it because we're going to be handling a lot of things using our WebSocket connection rather than registering routes and stuff like that. Um, I've, you know, I've just tried to bootstrap this with some simple stuff. Um, it pulls some version information, uh, it sets up the Koa instance and a, and a Koa router, which we, again, we barely need because we have one route here, which is the root route. Um, and right here, so, so Koa, like Express, has this model where you create an instance, you configure it, you kind of tell it what different things you want it to do, and then you start it. And so down here is where the part where we're actually starting it, right? Um, this whole long, I, I wish that it would format this on multiple lines once it gets long enough, it will. But for now, um, this tells Koa to use a body parser, which allows us to use JSON, use the WebSocket library, uh, register these routes that we've added to our router, which there is only one. Uh, this tells it what methods the router is allowed to use. And then it starts listening on the port that we've configured, which by default is 8888. Okay. So, and, and this is why, you know, if you go to localhost 8888, you'll see that it's, it's alive. Um, there is a server there, but it's not prepared to uh, handle your request. And I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll tell you why. Um, okay. So this is, so this is the other piece of this, right? Which is that, you know, um, I need, in order for these two clients to communicate, you know, what we're building here is a, is a you know, a, a server client chat system. So the way that a message is going to get from client A to client B is that client A is going to send it to the server. The server is going to use information it has about the clients and their connections and things like that to figure out, oh, okay, well, I also need to send this to client B. And then the server is going to uh, transmit that data out on another WebSocket connection. And so, you know, Again, this is another place where we're going to maintain state. Um, I don't know uh, how, I mean, th this was me sort of getting started on this project. I'm not sure how many of these I'll use, um, but these are various mappings that we might feel like we need, right, eventually. So you want to start to think about kind of like, what do I need to be able to do, right? Well, when a message comes in, I mean, basically, this is not that complicated. When a message comes in, the server has to do a couple of things. The first is it has to figure out where should it send this message. Um, you know, this is a chat message. It's sent by some client to a room. It's the room that should that the server needs to turn into a essentially a list of web sockets. So I get a message from a client to a particular room. I need to know what other web sockets of connected clients correspond to that room. And then I go one at a time through those web sockets and I send the message out. That's it. There's a couple of, you know, little bits and pieces of complication, right? One is that I might want to control access to the room. So when a message comes in for a room, I might want to make sure that the client is allowed to send that message. Um, but that's, that's almost it, right? Um, I might want to do some things eventually, like I might want to allow, people to retrieve old messages for a room. So when you log in, you might send a request that I send you back, you know, the last hundred messages that were sent in that room or something like that. So you can populate the UI appropriately, whatever, right? But, but our, part of our goal here it should be to keep this pretty simple. 
Okay, so now how does the server-side code look? Well, the server-side code actually looks in certain ways a little similar to client-side code. I have a web socket that gets set up and this is, this is using a, a COA library that allows me to take an incoming connection and convert it to a web socket connection. And there's some magic involved here, but you don't really need to worry about it. Um, however, this is why this happens, right? This is why I get an internal server error because the server is trying to upgrade the connection to, well, actually, sorry, uh, no, actually, it's not the reason I get a server error, but, but I would get a server error later as the server tries to upgrade this to a web socket connection. Okay, so why do I get an error when, when this happens, and where is that error coming from, right? So you can look and you can actually see on your, if you have this up and running in your terminal, that I'm, I'm getting you know, a validation error, um, and it actually should show me pretty uh, close to the line number where that's being thrown, and it's right here, okay? So remember in our client, when we connect, the server expects us to connect and provide query parameters of a particular format, and this is one of the places where we're using that run pipes library. So when we connect, uh, the, the client checks this object to make sure that it matches the shape of a connection query. The connection query is defined over here. A connection query should have a client ID property that's a string, a version property that's a string, and a commit that's a string. And if you look at what we provided here, we didn't provide any query parameters. And so that's why, one of the reasons why it's failed. Um, when the client connects, it's actually gonna make sure that it provides that information. And if it doesn't, this is actually going to fail, right? So if we, so again, this is one of the places where it's nice to, you know, to have run types as part of our program, because when we go ahead and, and break this, what we're gonna see is the whole thing just melts down. Um, because again, same thing. So when the client tried to connect, it didn't provide data in the right shape, okay? Um, so this is one of those places where we're sending data across a wire until we're validating it on both ends, right? The client is checking the shape of the data before it sends it to the server, and then the server, back to the server site code over here, um, the server is checking the shape of the data uh, when it gets, okay? And we can, so now we have these three pieces of information that we can use here. Let's, let's look at what's actually being sent. Um, and kind of, you know, just get a sense of a little bit about how you might uh, start to, to, okay, so here's, you can see when the, so, so this is one of the things that this, this WebSocket library does for us, it's pretty nice. So the server just went down for an instant because it rebooted, basically. When we change the server side code, the server, the server's actually going to restart, right? Keep this in mind later if you decide to start storing state on the server, because anytime you restart, anytime you make a code change to the code of the server, it's like you control seed it and restarted it. Um, and so it starts up knowing nothing about the world. Um, in this case, you can see that when it started, it received an incoming connection from this tab. This is the UUID that was provided. This is the version, um, which is pulled out of the package.json file. And this is the current commit. And it's actually the, uh, let's see here. Oh, whoops, no, don't do that. Um, let's see if that's actually in here. Yeah, 2AC066, that's here, right? So this identifies the last commit that we made. Okay, um, good. So, I'll get rid of this guy. All right, so, so I think at this point, well, let me kind of walk through a little bit more of this, right? So as we did on the client, we're adding some event listeners here. Now, one of the things that you should, note is that there's no event for open because this is the open event handler. Like that's what's happening, right? So we don't need to register an event handler for open. We're opening the WebSocket connection. That's why this code is running. Um, on the client, you know, so essentially like the, the, the way these protocols work is the client initiates the connection, but the server can reject it. So in the future, we might do things like reject connections if they don't have login information provided, right? Um, but for now, we're going to accept the connection as long as the query string checks out. Um, and then we're going to uh, add some event listeners. And this is, this is where things kind of things start to happen, right? Okay. So it's 
coming up to the hour mark, let me, um, again, you guys are always welcome to ask questions, but let, let me kind of talk through a little bit about how I was, I, I'm thinking about how the next, the next step that needs to happen. Okay, and, and something that I can kind of leave for you guys as an exercise over the weekend. Now, again, keep in mind, this is your project. So uh, what I would encourage you to do is actually fork this um, and kind of go off in your own direction with it, right? I am not, you know, I, I, will, I will take the best parts of each one of your projects if you guys end up with cool ways of doing things. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I want you guys to feel free to kind of do things in your own way. As long as you, you know, stay within the, the certain, uh, you know, suggestions that I've set up, right? Um, but one of the fun things about a project like this is, is getting to design these wire protocols and uh, and the server, the client server protocol. So, so my thinking here, right, was that when the client connects and wants to join a room, it sends this join message to the client. Uh, sorry, to the server. Okay. So where does that need to happen? So let's go look at our client side code. Um, and that's going to have to happen right here. This is the point at which we have an opportunity to send this message. Essentially, one of our chat room presentational components has said, hey, I want to join this room. And now I should do something, right? I need to send a message to the server. Right? Um, this is the message that I've set up for you guys to use. Again, if you need to add other things here, that's fine. One thing to keep in mind, all the code that runs in here, and you can also pass this information to helper functions if you decide to do that, has access to these variables. For people that are new to JavaScript, this can, be, this, this can seem like very uh, concerning, shall we say, right? The, the way that you guys have been taught to think about functions is the function runs and then it ends, and then it's like those variables are not there anymore. Um, but JavaScript, well, I mean, JavaScript works that way at some level, right? But here's what happens. When you, th this thing that you're passing to this filter ping pong message is, is a callback. That callback is a function. Like this is a anonymous function in JavaScript. It's a function literal, okay? Um, it has a, a parameter list, right? It receives a single, uh, it receives an object. It's like to have a data, uh, a data parameter. And Starting here, this is a block of code. This is a function, okay? Because the function is declared inside of the context of this function that we pass to router.get, it closes around the variables that were created inside router.get. So this callback, anytime it's called, right? Because this is gonna get called later, like way later, like five minutes from now, people start chatting in the room and this function starts to get called. It will always have access to the values of client ID version and commit that it got as part of the query string, okay? So you don't need to send this stuff around. Anything you provide in the parameters for the initial connection is always available to your connection code inside here. Now again, if you decide to write a helper function, that helper function needs to be past the data because that helper function is declared outside of this context, right? So if I wanna write a like a, you know, function join room, um, I can't assume that it has access to this, this commit. There's no variable in this scope. Now I can pass that variable uh, to it as a parameter and then we're fine, right? But the code that runs in these method handlers and uh, down here does have access to that information. And it will also have access to the ID of, and, and, and basically anything that you set up in here, right? It will have access. Um, so that so so you might be thinking, well, along with my join message, don't I always need to provide the client ID and you know stuff like that? And the answer is no, right? All the identity that's associated with the connection should already be available to all further messages that get sent over this this, this website. Um, okay, so again, my thinking about how to do this, yours may differ, would be that the client is going to send the server a join message. The server will then um, handle that join message and send back a rooms message, all right? So that rooms message, uh, 
we're, we're using these types so that we can identify these messages uniquely. Um, and then the rooms messages has this uh, array of strings. And that should identify all the rooms that that client is connected to. Okay. So this, and again, I mean, there might be other ways to do this, right? You could send back a join message. You could send back a confirmation message that just says you managed to join this room. Um, I like to send more data rather than less frequently. So in this way, I can remind the client what rooms it's part of. I could send this message when the client connects if I remember that it's in certain rooms. So again, think about refresh, right? Um, now again, we don't necessarily have to do that. It might not be the right way to, to do things, but this also allows us to reject room requests, right? So for example, if the client sends a join message to a room it's not allowed to join, I just send back a rooms message that doesn't include that room, right? And that, that constitutes showing. But again, you guys, this is one of the fun parts of building these things. You guys get to, to, to make, these, make these choices. Once a, a client is part of a, um, a room, so you might, uh, might also be wondering, like, why do, I, why do I need to know what, what rooms the client is in? Um, on the server, this is something I'm expecting to use to modify this mapping. Okay, so this mapping essentially tells me which clients are in each room, right? Um, and I'm using client IDs here. So when I get a message for that room later, what I would do is I would say, okay, now again, let's just assume the client is allowed to send to the room. We'll deal with that later. Um, I look up the room ID in this mapping and that gives me a, a, a list of client IDs. That's all the participants in this room. Then I go through this mapping, which maps client IDs to WebSocket, and that gives me a WebSocket handle for each one of the clients. That's something that I can then call send on, right? So that's what I can actually use to send the message, right, out to the client. Um, so, so that was my that was my plan for, for what to do next, right? Is to implement join, um, and you know, uh, and, and that because again. Once you have join working, send becomes easy, right? It's just not as hard as, I mean, a lot of the state, send really doesn't modify much state, right? All send does is use state that you've already set up, right? Um, and so join is, is, is where, the, where the action really happens. Um, all right, so but before we do, before we, I let you guys go, I'll just, I'll, I'll take questions here for a minute. I can hang around for, for a couple of minutes if you guys have other questions. Uh, questions. Um, I'm also happy to sort of get started with this if you guys want to watch and um, but I want to fix that problem we have. Ah, okay, this, this is the problem. Uh, we need to make sure that we save our client ID. So, so right now, um, and again, here let's, let's verify that this is a problem. So if I log the client ID when my Twitter provider starts up, what I want is I want that to be stable across reloads. Um, and what you'll see right now is that it's not going to be. Uh, see, it's changing every time. Uh, it's unique, but it's different. And that's not what I want. I want it to be the same. Um, so how am I gonna fix that? Essentially, I need to make sure that before, um, you know, and this is something that you could do inside use effect. Um, you don't wanna do this every time, so I only need to save it once. I need to make sure I put it in the session storage in the place that I expected it to be. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do session storage dot, this is set item. I need to use the same, I'm doing this poorly. Um, I need to use the same key that I use here, and then I'm gonna use client ID dot current. That uh, should work. Okay, so let's see if this is actually. Going to, going, to, going to happen. Okay, so now, oh, I still need to log it though. All right. All right, so now it's C7 something something and it's that again. Okay, so that's, that's good. If you guys, if you guys are using, you probably shouldn't have to do much more with that. I, I'll push this change and basically that's fixed. Um, if you guys are using, you guys get curious about this type of storage, which is like fairly limited, but also super useful. Um, there is a way to investigate what's going on in your local storage. So for example, I, I always can I always forget what it is. Um, all right. So 
Yeah, and you can see I'm using this on some other products because <laughs> there's some other keys in here that don't have anything to do with this. So let's look at session storage, right? So session storage is what we're using, and here's this key, right? Um, I've also got this saved position. I don't know what that is. Oh, I do know what. Sorry, <laughs> something for the element tracker. Um, I should really start naming these better, otherwise I'm gonna have to start having collisions. So this, the, all this is telling me in my browser is, is what values the particular page is set up, right? I can also look at stuff that was sent by other sites. So this is part of the Google login uh, library that we're using. It, it apparently is used some storage as well. So, all right, so that's fixed. Um, so again, I, why don't I, you know, just for fun, if, if you guys would prefer, uh, you know, the challenge of, of figuring this out yourself, by all means, uh, don't let me stop you, uh, but I will, let's see here, if I can find my, my meeting again, where did you go? Okay, back to meeting. Okay. Figure out who's here. Okay, so if you guys want, like I said, you, you guys are welcome to, to to log off at this point and then you know work on this on your own, save the suspense. Otherwise, I'm going to try to get the room thing to work. Um, okay, so so as I pointed out, the place we need to start is we need to get our client to actually send this message for us. Um, so what we're going to do at this point. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to, we need to formulate our message, right? So that's the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, um, join message is equal to join message dot check. And then I need to set the type to join, I'm pretty sure. And then the room ID. Um, and so you, so you might be wondering, like, why isn't um, TypeScript helping me here, right? And, and the reason is, TypeScript does not know what kind of, once TypeScript knows what a particular type of thing is, it will help you uh, suggest the properties that you might want to use, but it doesn't know what that object is, right? I'm, I'm conjuring this out of thin air. Once I have a join message, now you see TypeScript actually knows what the fields are. So one of the cool things about run types is when you check an object literal, like I just did, the thing that you get back is typed properly, right? So now if I hover over this, um, you know, TypeScript knows what the shape of, of this message is. Okay, so now I just want to send this. So let's just do that. Um, that send and I think yeah, I think you need to convert this to a string, which is annoying. Um, we, we could write a little helper function to do that, but we'll just do that manually. Um, okay, cool. Um, and I think that's all I need to do. Now you'll notice here that it's, that it's stuck in this, this optional property axis for me. Um, that makes sense on some level, right? Because what's happening here is it's saying, hey, connection.current might be undefined if I, don't, if I haven't set up the connection yet, right? Um, and so in that case, you know, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to send a join message. This might end up being a problem, right? We'll, we'll see because keep in mind we set up um, the we set up this this call this uh, we set up our web second connection after this component is mounted. So it's possible that at this point the, the connection isn't ready yet. So let's try the following: to connection dot log console dot log connection dot current just to see if we actually have anything ready to if we have a connection that's ready to use at that point, or if we need to, to figure out a way to get the client to wait. Okay, so, okay, so it's undefined. Okay, so that's not good. Um, so why is this happening? Okay, um, the reason it's happening is um, this call to join must be happening before the WebSocket connection is set up, okay? Now, how are we gonna fix this? Well. One of the pieces of information that we're passing down to our uh, to our subscribers, to our contacts, is is connected, right? Uh, we're telling it whether or not we have a connection ready. And join is not a function that should be called if we're not connected. So let's do the following. We're going to say, if I'm connected, then 
Oh, I can remember how to do reformat on, yeah, then send the join message. Right? Um, so this will now make the component that's farther down in the tree wait, and now, oh, that's okay. I think, yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. So now you'll see that um, I don't send this, uh, by the time I actually get into my callback here, I'm actually, uh, I have a WebSocket connection, so I'm good. Okay. So now we're sending data to the server. So we should actually be able to see this on our server. So let's go back to our server side code. And this join message, so what, what's happening in this, in this message block, okay? So the first thing we're doing is we're actually uh, using json.parse to take this data, which is a string, and we're converting it into a message. And now if we want, we could log this. It can be useful during, uh, during development. The logs are gonna come out over here, right? And you can see that I'm receiving a join message, which is pretty cool. Um, what, what, one of the other features you get with um, run types is you get this idea of, of being able to use guards. Um, so a type guard, essentially what this does is it says, if the message matches the shape of a join message, then I'm gonna enter this, um, this block of code. So let's make sure that's actually working. Uh, so move our, we'll move our logging messages into. Is, um, yeah, is, the shape, is the shape determined by the types of the um, uh, message or the, Parameter names themselves. You know, it's a great question. I think it. I, I think it uses both, but okay. I'm not sure. Uh, the, the the way that I've seen this done is by that you 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 provide a type literal. Okay. I don't. I I have to go look. This would be an interesting thing to look up, right? The sure. idea is that by providing a type literal, making sure that all these values are unique, I can oh, guarantee okay. yeah, that yeah. run types can distinguish between them. Right. Oh yeah, I wasn't sure how TypeScript hand, TypeScript handled that. Well, so, is, that was like... so keep in mind, this is not TypeScript. This is run types, right? Right. TypeScript right, right. cannot do this because TypeScript type information is gone once the program runs. Right? Mm -hmm. At this point, I have data as an unknown. Now, now I could sort of write it my. I could write something like this in TypeScript myself, right? But um, by using information that I know about about the data, but but this. You know, TypeScript's great at tracking how data flows through your system, but when it has this piece of, this is basically an unknown piece of data. You can see that the type that it provides is any, right? The idea is that I have no idea what this is. Um, and even after I parse it as JSON, I still have no idea what this is. Any is, for those of you who did a new TypeScript, any is TypeScript's like whatever. It's TypeScript's object. There's no idea what's in there, right? Um, so, you know, in order to actually, now when I'm down here, you see that it actually has a shape, right? So now, the, and that's the other thing that you get out of these type guards, right? Uh, when you use a uh, run types type guard inside this if statement, uh, a message will have, I, I know it knows what the shape of message is, right? You know, if I, if I try to run that same, so, so this is actually, again, for those of you that have used Kotlin, this is sort of Kotlin-esque, right? In Kotlin, I can do like a if message is join message, and then inside the if statement, it's already it's automatically been cast for. Okay, so now what do I actually need to do here? Um, so I have this nice little to do uh, message that I left for myself um, or for you actually. Um, so I need to update these maps. Okay, so I need to to get this client into the uh, mapping for this room. Right, so really what I need to manipulate is this room to client IDs mapping. I need to add this client ID to that array. Now it's possible that array doesn't exist, right? So the first thing I need to do is I need to say, if uh, uh, room in uh, room to, and, and I'm sorry, I've been writing Kotlin all day, so it's possible that I'm just still like totally gonna Work some of this because I'm the syntax between the two is really similar, and I'm not <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm going to do this perfectly, but I'm sure it'll help me. As is room ID, right? Okay. So for those again, for those of you new to JavaScript or TypeScript, this is syntax. So, so this is equivalent to um, 
confused for my big job or my those, those do the same thing. Um, it's mad now because there's two of them, but this, th these two pieces of syntax are the same. This is nicer, and it's particularly nicer when you have multiple things that you want to peel off the object, right? So a lot of times, you know, you get like a whole object's worth of information in JavaScript, and what I really want to do is destructure it, so I grab a couple of the properties that I'm going to use and, and ignore the rest of it. Um, for now, I could just say constant room ID is a message dot room ID, but there might eventually be more fields on this message, and so I'm just going to do it. I don't need to type information at this point, right? Because that's already been used, right? Type is what got me into the guard in the first place. So at that point, I, I don't care. All right, so this happens if this is the first time anybody has joined this room, right? Uh, or the first time that I've seen anybody join this room. And so in this case, I actually need to create a, a new room array. So I'm going to do is I'm going to say room to client IDs room is equal to, uh, sorry, room ID is equal to, uh, just this, right? That's the empty, that's an empty array. Um, now that I know that there's an array there, I can do ID dot push. And the question is, what am I putting in here, right? Uh, I, and what I'm supposed to be putting in here is a client ID. Um, and I've got that, again, in my, uh, in my closure, right? So I, I, I know this, right? You know, it's, <laughs> you know, if you just squint at this code, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this code is actually inside an if statement that's inside this function, right? And again, that's one of the things that's weird about JavaScript for people that are coming uh, from other languages. It's not. This is a function, okay? The, the contract that gets established here is that the WebSocket is going to call this function any time a message arrives, right? So, so again, the first time I enter, when I, the first time that this method, eh, where'd it go? Um, when the client connects, this function is not called immediately. Probably not, right? Because I, I haven't received any messages yet. So this function gets called later. So again, this function gets called that I'm registering to run anytime there's a request for the root route. All of this code gets run, but all that happens the first time is I've registered this event listen. Then later, the WebSocket, when a message arrives, runs this code, but the code still has access to the closure that was established by this first function. So it still has access to all these variables, right? You know, again, like I, I've been using JavaScript for a long time, but when I started using it, man, was it confusing. Uh, you know, it's just like, because you're used to thinking about code running like one line at a time, and then maybe I jump backwards. And this idea that like this block of code can run later um, after this function exits, but still run as if it's inside the function is like weird. And also it turns out to be beautiful and, and awesome because it allows you to do a lot of cool stuff. Okay. Um, Okay, so, so now that, that okay, uh, maybe we're done. I don't think we're quite done. Oh, right, I need to do this too. So I'm also tracking the rooms that the client ID is in, right? And this is really, to be honest, on some level, just so I can send these room messages, right? But let's also update that piece of space. So, um, and actually, the other thing is, when the client connects, we don't, at this point, we don't know anything about the rooms that it's in. Now, We'll talk about this next week in terms of where this state should live, right? Because some of you might be thinking, oh, shouldn't the server be storing the state? I'm not sure that it should, actually. Because um, here's the thing. The client typically knows what rooms it wants to be in because that's a function of the state of the page, right? So when a client connects initially, it'll probably know the rooms that it's supposed to be in. If that assumption changes in the future, then we might need to, to update things on the server. But for now, the idea is that we know uh, when, when the client connects, it's initially in no room, and we expect it to tell us about all the rooms that it wants to join, okay? So all to say that when the client connects, we can set client ID rooms, client ID to be an empty array. Um, I'll put on a comment here. Uh, actually, well, client to remember what room it wants to join. Okay, cool, we'll just clear that out. Again, we could store this more statefully. We could store it across multiple calls, and eventually there is data in the system that we're gonna have to put into a database, but we'll get there. You know, I didn't even, I, I tore the database configuration out for now, because we'll, we'll, that's, that's something that we'll, we'll have a chance to enjoy in the future. Um, 
All right. So we've got so this so this I know will exist, and now I'm going to do client ID to rooms uh, dot uh, push. Oh, sorry. Client ID dot push room ID. Okay. So now I've updated both my map. Um, okay. I think that's it. Oh, and now uh, as the to do indicates, I want to reply with a room message. Um, now, so, so the other thing, you know, again, is this comment indicates that we're doing is so far we're basically allowing the client to create a room by joining it. That's probably fine. And that might be something that we continue to do in the future. We might start to have rules about what rooms clients are allowed to create, right? So if a room has particular types and a client, certain type of client might not be able to just create that room. But for now, our model is basically um, room creation goes along with joining. Right, so once I join a room, the um, the client, you know, is automatically sorry. When I when I make a request to join the room, the room is created if it didn't exist before. That's essentially what's happening here, right? I'm adding it to my room ID map if I've never heard of that room. Okay, um, I don't know if we'll fix this later or not. Um, I'll say we'll revisit this. Um, okay. So now what we want to do is we want to send a message back. We want to send this rooms message that we were talking about. And so now you guys have seen the client to server communication. Now we'll see the server to client communication. It looks very simple. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, room message is equal to rooms message dot check. Um, type is rooms. Uh, the value is client ID to rooms with this client ID, okay? Oh, and it's mad about something because I didn't give it a key because I don't remember what I called it, and it's called rooms. What a reasonable name for that field. Oh, rooms. Uh, and, oh, God. At some point, some, I'm gonna figure out how to make these not be errors. Oh, that's what I want. Okay, and now let's send it back, All right? We too, just like the client, have a WebSocket, and that WebSocket leads. Now in this case, things are easier because I'm sending the message back to the same client. In the future, we're gonna have to figure out what WebSockets correspond to other clients so that we can send WebSockets to a client that didn't send the message, right? That's what happens when we receive a message that needs to be distributed. We get the message, we figure out based on the room, what other clients in that room, we send the message back to, to, those, to those clients. All right, so now let's send this back. We're gonna do a uh, room's message. Again, we need to swingify this. That is it. All right, so let's try it. Let's see if anything blows up. Uh, okay, I don't see anything. Nothing looks like it's blown up yet. Uh, reloading the page should cause us. This is normal. I'm sorry. I have spent at least an hour trying to make that go away. What can you do? So just ignore it. Um, I've, <laughs> anyway, I'm sad. I, I hate, I, you know, it's like one of those fun cost fallacy things. The more time you spend trying to get something like that fixed, the worse you feel about the fact that you can't actually get it fixed. But it, it's clearly it's like buried in the depths of node somewhere. And they'll fix it someday. But not today. Um, all right, so that's good. Now, now let's go back to our client. You know, so now we're seeing the server to client communication pattern. And now what we want to do is make, let's see what's happening here. So let's see if we're actually getting a rooms message back. If I put in that listener for that. Uh, so it's going to rebuild, it's going to connect. Uh, and there it is. Check it out. Ah, now, you'll see the, now, eh, that's my fault. Um, what we should probably do is, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this as an exercise to the reader. You really want to unique, uh, you, you want to have both of these be unique, right? So we don't actually want uh, the same uh, client. There's a couple of different ways you could do this. You could make this a multi-level record uh, and just store true values in it. Uh, that's a totally, that's basically kind of an equivalent of a set in, in JavaScript, right? So how, let's see how we would do that. We would basically say, 
our client ID to rooms um, would be a record from room ID to Boolean. Okay. Uh, and now, again, the magic of TypeScript, uh, you can see that it's actually helping us because now it knows that this is not okay, right? I can't, uh, I, I can't just set this to be an array. I can set it to be an empty object, and that's cool, right? Um, let's do the same thing here, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to set this to be a record, oh, record from client ID to Boolean. Can you, um, can you describe the uh, um, record? Thing. Yeah, so so a record is like a map. Okay. Yeah, it's like a map in Java or I don't know a dictionary in in Python, except it has sure. Python, okay. right? Now keep in mind I've I've just defined these as strings up here. These are just a convenience to help keep yep. things straight. I found that to be helpful because now the type has semantic meaning, right? Um, you know, so for example, here I know that basically I'm using this to get a, from a room ID to client ID. Right, from a client ID to room ID, right? And what is um, the, what's the Boolean storing here in this, in the case of In this, this case, it's just, it's just there. We're just gonna set it to true and then we'll delete it later. It just exists so the map has a destination. Sure, okay. We're never gonna use those values. We're just gonna use them as, as keys. So, so again, what we'll do is we'll say, okay. So now we need to do the same thing here, except we're gonna set up an empty map. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna set Room ID client ID is equal to true. Client ID room ID is equal to true. And now this isn't going to be happy. So what we should be able to do is this. So we're going to do object keys. Sadly, this is oh, it's not as nice as some other languages. But this will give us all the keys for that object, right? All the keys should be all the the room ID. Right. Um, now, right now, I'm not filtering based on whether they're true or not. The reason is that if somebody left a room, which we don't have a way of, well, actually, we do. We can, we can do that. If somebody left a room, I would just delete either the whole map or I would delete all of those entries. Right. Um, and we can actually do that. Maybe we'll do the cleanup function in a minute. But let's actually make sure that the, 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 the thing's working the way that we wanted, which is now, yeah, there you go. Right, so now I just have one thing. Um, let's go down here and do the uh, do the cleanup here. Okay, so now we're going to do is we're going to say uh, client. So the the easy one is um, well, actually, here's the problem. So we actually need that first. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what rooms was this client in. So we're going to say classic. Uh, rooms is equal to um, object.keys, client ID to rooms, client ID, right? This will give us a list of rooms. Then we're going to say uh, for, oh man, I need, do I have Lodash here? Not yet. Okay, we'll put that in next time. I'm going to actually, uh, I can write for each though because. So for those of you that, again, and this is where I'm really going to get into trouble with, with Kotlin. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen this sort of style, this is very JavaScript-y. Uh, this is a JavaScript loop. Um, what I want, what I, why am I doing this? Uh, remind myself, I'm doing it because I need to kill off all of these guys. So I'm going to do room ID to client ID, room ID, and I'm going to delete that. Oh, right, client ID. Oh, I'm room. Okay. And why is it angry with me? What is this? Oh, really? Is that the problem? Oh, yeah. At some point, I'm going to figure out how to get these linting errors to not show up as errors. Okay. So essentially, what I'm doing here um, is, and, and you know, you, you could have a more sophisticated data structure for this little silly piece of information, but whatever. Um, here we basically have two maps, one mapping uh, clients to rooms, the second mapping rooms to clients. Um, when a client leaves, I need to remove it from all the rooms it was part of. So I figure out what rooms it was part of, and then I go through 
the room ID to client ID mapping, and I delete its entry. Now, the next part is much simpler. All I do is delete client ID to, uh, sorry, uh, client ID to rooms, client ID, I can just, I think I can delete the whole thing. Yeah, there we go, okay. So I just take the whole, the client's gone, right? So I can just take the whole mapping out for client ID to room. Um, and at this point, client IDs is also uh, tracking uh, the, the keys in client ID to rooms are also tracking the clients that are connected. That's not really what we want, um, but that will be okay. All right, I'm gonna do one last piece of this for you guys, uh, and then I'm gonna let you go for the, for, and, and leave, leave the next little bit, which is kind of the fun part uh, for you to do uh, over, over the weekend. So the last thing we need is we need to maintain this mapping. So we're, we're almost to the point where we can actually do a set, um, but, we need to update this mapping because I actually need to be able to figure out for a particular client ID what its web socket is. And this actually turns out to be really easy. Um, let's put this, let me just do a little bit of cleanup here. Let's put this down here. Um, because at this point, I have a web socket. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, client ID to web socket, client ID is equal to web socket. There you go. And then I also need to delete that down here. Uh, okay, there you go. So now I know for each client what rooms it's in, I know for each room what clients are in it, and I know for each client what its web socket handles. And those pieces of information should be sufficient to allow you to distribute a message properly. One sort of important uh, a bit of this that's going to cause you a little bit of grief initially, but or, or at least you need to think about, okay? This, our demo right now, consists of two rooms with the same name on a single client, okay? Now, that might seem a little dumb. Maybe it is, um, but it's a nice way of doing this demo as opposed to forcing you to have two tabs open all the time, which would be kind of a pain. However, what this means is that when a client sends a message to a room, the server needs to send it back to that client. Now, you might think, well, this is sort of wasteful, but you probably can come up with some reasons why this is nice. So for example, this allows us, this allows the client to know that the message was received, right? So, you know, you guys have used chat servers, typically they have some visual notification that says your message was received by the other party, right? So what's gonna happen is one of your chat boxes is gonna send a message. That message is gonna get to the server and you're gonna send it right back. At this point, there's only one WebSocket connection to the server, right, from one tab. So it's gonna come right back on that connection. And you wanna know that right, because you might want to update the UI in a certain way or whatever, but you also should make sure that that message still gets distributed to all of the chat boxes that are subscribed to that particular, uh, particular uh, message, that particular room, sorry. Okay. All right, so, so again, this next bit is, is it's tricky. Um, there's nothing uh, that we haven't, um, there's nothing about it that we haven't seen, you guys haven't seen already. Um, one of the things I will encourage you to think about is how do you get messages back to this presentational component? So right now our context includes a Boolean that tells the, the component whether or not it's connected to the server and a function that I can call to join. Now keep in mind, this is JavaScript, so I can pass functions around. Um, so for example, my join, well, actually, sorry, um, so right now, my join function already takes a, uh, a callback, okay? So let's see here, let's go back to my, so if you look here at this, this is a pretty gnarly type definition, at least for people who are getting beginners. This says join is a function. It takes a room of type room ID as its first parameter, and its second parameter, see I, I already did some of this, which I, I know why, because this is a little tricky. Um, its second parameter is a function that gets called any time a message is received. That function is passed a message that's a chitter message. 
okay? And it doesn't return anything. And this whole thing doesn't return anything, okay? So as a second parameter, you're already being passed a callback called on receive, and you might want to use that function in the way that it was intended, right? So this is the component is basically giving you a, a way for you to send data back to it. So when you get a message for any components that are subscribed to that room, you should call their on receive method. And I will, I will leave that to you guys to figure out how to do that. Okay, any last final thoughts? Um, are you gonna um, push these changes so that we can pull to work on it for yeah. our yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will I'll do that right right after we get off. Yeah. And you guys can use this as a starting point. So so again, I think you know here here's what I'm suggesting. Um, let's do this again on Tuesday. I'm gonna go ahead and do and do this, and then you guys can take a stab at it and we'll get back together and we'll kind of go over, you know, how to approach it. Sound good? Cool. All good. Sounds great. All right. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Bye.